If you didn't read these, you probably have serious questions about this ending. Hey internet, I'm Steve the Cosmere Knot, and this is Raffo. Defiant is out! Or at least it's about to be! If you weren't able to fit in a reread of the first three Skyward novels, I've got that video available here. If you want a review of the Skyward Flight novellas, as well as the original Sightover story, Defending Elysium, I got you right here. There are three novellas from Spence's Flightmates, available on ebook individually, or printed together in this! This one's great, because it also has some commentary from Brandon, too. This is awesome. The first is Sunreach. From FM's point of view, it starts up right before the superiority attack that summoned the Delver in the final chapters of Starsight. After the fight, she passes a Tanix in the halls of Platform Prime that she mistakes for Doomslug. Jorgen has made it back from the caverns on Detritus with a payload of Tanix, and Cobb puts him, Rig, and FM in charge of figuring out how to hyperdrive them. There are three varieties there. The hyperjumping yellow-blue, purple and orange, and red and black ones that it's important you don't yell at or squeeze too hard. Cuddle with caution. And that's why Jorgen has cuts all over his face the first time Spencer makes contact with him in Cytonic. We'll actually see that interaction a little later. Cobb received a transmission from Kuna, who is trapped on a research outpost called Sunreach. Info for rescue? Tradesies? FM and Jorgen wake up Alanique, who's been unconscious for a whole book, and things are going pretty well until Cobb and Jorgen's mom barge in with demands and threats. She yells at Jorgen's brain and then voips away. Adults, am I right? FM is still on slug hunting duty and goes to help Rig find and repair the FTL communicator. They like each other. Turns out there's a slug slot for comms as well. Doom slugs bloop. Boom slugs boom, so the purple and orange slugs must calm? They successfully hyperjump with the yellow blue Tanix, shoving Jorgen into a cupboard, and go to try it on a ship. It works! But now the superiority knows they can hyperjump, so it's planetary bombardment time. Skyward Flight tries to disable the main gun on the superiority battleship, but Detritus manages to activate a shield around the planet. It's during this fight that Spensa first makes contact with Jorgen. He voips the flight back to Platform Prime. FM and Rig go to try out a slug in the hypercom device, and then they kiss. It works! The slug. I mean, the kiss probably works too. They're able to contact Kuna, who sends coordinates to Jorgen's brain, which begin to fade quickly. Cobb approves Skyward Flight's immediate departure. Bloop! It's a giant space starfish! With a research station living on the same rock. Jorgen is having trouble directing the Tanix where he wants them to go. In the course of the battle, it looks like his ship gets blown to pieces. I mean, it does, but he's okay. He voiped into the actual research station, whose life support systems are actively failing. The Tanix manage to collect the rest of the flight members, and Jorgen brings them all home. Read on! Alanique, who voiped away at the beginning of Sunreach, is back on her home planet watching sports in a giant tree. There are two factions in her society, one striving for unity, aka shacking up with the superiority, and the other for independence, which wants... a. Uh, I independence. There's a bunch of Cytonics here, and Alanique and her mentor Rinnekin get called to a meeting on a different giant tree. She says nah, but they get jumped and Rinnekin gets nabbed by some superiority stooges, showing that Unity is already allied and wanting more power. She tries to make for a different base, but there's Unity there too. Alanique reaches back out to Jorgen and manages to hyperjump back to Detritus. She wants to make an alliance with the DDF for support against the Unity faction. Is there a show where the Empire is not the bad guy? Star Trek. Cobb thinks an alliance would be great, but Jeshua, Jorgen's mom, says no, bureaucracy! Ultimately, the official answer is no. The National Assembly is trying to work something out with the superiority, which is concerning to everyone but the National Assembly. But Cobb can't really stop them from going on their own, so... Yeah, bye, Mom. Bloop! They're back on Redon and managed to snag the superiority prison transport. Can't do anything with it yet, though, because more folks are on their way. Light nets are a cool natural extension of light lances. Bloop! Down to Wandering Leaf, basically one of the Detritus defense platforms, but on Redon instead. There's some independence folk down there, including Alanique's brother. But then they get a broadcast from Rinnekin, saying he's pro-unity now. Well, gotta go rescue him. But first they need to get this platform under control. 
Bloop! Here's Rig! The superiority wants the DDF's Tanix and Cytonix, and Cobb's acting weird. Rig fixes a bunch of stuff, Alanique helps Jorgen practice Cytonicking, and it turns out Boom Slug in the right box can really go boom. They voip the whole platform to just outside one of the giantest giant trees, then swoop in for their rescue mission. Alanique, with the newly bestowed call sign of Angel, Arturo likes her, runs into Rinnekin's house. But oops, it ain't Rinnekin! The superiority has been putting in work on the mini holographic projectors they got from Mbot. Arturo comes in and busts some heads. Well, knees. Again with the knees. They escape and are able to snag the real Rinnekin, but the superiority shows up in force, ready to blow up one of them big old trees. Uncool. Jorgen and Rielnikin broadcast to the populace that the superiority are liars and they suck, and Rig voips the platform close enough to the superiority battleship that it gets wrecked. Cobb calls them and tells them to come back to Detritus with some Erdia leadership. Ah, that is a fake Cobb. A corn Cobb? Alanique talks to Grand Gran, who's being handed over to the superiority. Say it with me. It's a trap! Alanique and Jorgen go grab the corn Cobb. I'm sorry, it's just so funny to me. Then try and get to Grand Gran and Jorgen's parents. Grand Gran is able to voip herself and real Cobb off the ship, but there's a boom slug bomb rigged to go off, with the National Assembly, including Jorgen's parents, locked in a room on the ship. Jeshua tells Jorgen to do better than they did, and Alanik pulls him off the ship. Boom. Don't trust their peace indeed. Evershore. Alanik can't find the real Cobb and Grand Gran with her cytonic senses. Jorgen argues with the Vice Admiral, saying that Cobb is still in command, and that Skyward Flight were the last people to receive orders from him, so they're gonna go do the orders. A couple days later, Alanik is helping Jorgen practice his cytonic listening, and hears Kari of the Kitson trying to contact Spensa, saying they have their humans, albeit unconscious. Jorgen leverages that Cobb talked to us last again, and they voip to Evershore, the Kitson home planet. As usual, reception of humans is split. Kari, who knew Spensa as Alanik training on Starsight, is cool. Goro considers their arrival an invasion and wants to duel in Mortal Kombat? But before that, we feast! Alanik can't sense a cytonic presence from Grand Grand's body, so that's weird. The rest of Skyward Flight have a beach episode. Then it's Senate meeting time. Goro says they gotta go. Kari says they're cool. Jorgen gets distracted by grief over his parents and accidentally mind blades the Senate chamber. Not a good look, Jorgen. Juno, the Kitson lore keeper, offers to train him in mind blades. I picture it exactly like this. Inner peace. He manages to pop off a few mind blades, but then hears Grand Grand calling for help. The Kitson say they first appeared in the library, which Alanik and Jorgen realize contains a portal to nowhere. Before they can do anything, though, the superiority shows up. Dogfight time! Jorgen manages to use mind blades a few more times, but they need reinforcements! Bloop! Back to Detritus, Jorgen gets promoted and brings Wandering Leaf and more DDF flights back to Evershore. Pew, 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 pew! Wandering Leaf takes out a superiority carrier, but a superiority Death Star shows up and blows it up, with the auto turrets disabling the actual Death Star gun thing and Jorgen escaping before that happens. He gets into a dogfight with an enemy Cytonic, and his mind blades win the Rock Starfighter Scissor contest. They need more reinforcements! Hey guys. And Jorgen voips back to Detritus to get more platforms. Rig says there's lots of slug boxes, but they don't know what they all do or how to use them. Jorgen makes a call to all the Tanix still in the caverns beneath Detritus, offering food and a home. Bloop! Now figure out how to use them, Rig! Back to Evershore, Jorgen goes to the library, gets a vague impression of Spensa, and then figures out how to open the portal. Welcome back, ancient kits and cytonics, and also Grand Grand and Cobb's consciousnesses. The superiority sends out a life buster, and they do the same thing as at the end of Skyward. Kimmelin snipes it down, and Spensa, I mean Alanik, flies it away. Bunches more superiority ships arrive, ready to do maximum collateral damage. War, war crimes? War crimes. Evacuation starts. Jorgen, bloop! Hey, Rig, we need more platforms. Slugs. Sure thing, here's the whole planet! Trouble is, uh, gravity. Massive tidal wave on Evershore. 
but there must be some planetary grav caps preventing them from tearing each other apart. Rig starts to send platforms off Detritus and onto Evershore, and the superiority retreats. Cobb actually promotes Jorgen to Vice Admirable, Admiral, then announces his own retirement. Jorgen makes Arturo the new flight leader, and FM in charge of their diplomatic program. Once again, he reaches out cytonically and can feel Doomslug, who is worried about Spensa. He's determined to make sure she has a home to come back to. And that's the Skyward Flight novellas! If you only read the novels, now you know how the heck Jorgen is in command and they're orbiting a different planet. But we're not done! Let's jump backward hundreds of years to Brandon's first Cytonic story released in 2009, Defending Elysium. Once upon a time, 2071 to be exact, a failing phone company called Northern Bell invested in creating a technology-based telepathic linking. This took advantage of latent psionic abilities in some humans to communicate instantaneously over vast distances, eventually leading to faster-than-light travel. This wasn't the first time those abilities had been discovered. The Kitsune of Japanese folklore were in fact an alien race who visited Earth before their cytonics were lost. Kitson. This was, however, the first time in a long time that humanity was able to reach out to the wider universe. The phone company's experiments caught the attention of the Tanasi, like Peg, who sent a ship to Earth to say hey, which we then blew up. <sighs> This royally freaked out the rest of the universe because humans were way more technologically advanced than anyone else, even without Cytonics. The phone company was able to negotiate a peace agreement with the Tanasi, which also put them in total control of Cytonic technology and set them up to be the only point of contact with all other alien societies. By 2211, humanity has expanded beyond Jupiter into our solar system, has all but mastered FTL communication, and has secretly been developing Cytonic-based FTL travel. Jason Wright, the lead operative of the phone company, who has impressive cytonic abilities of his own, mind blades, FTL, sensing the world around him daredevil style, was called in to investigate the disappearance of a phone company researcher on the orbital platform of Evensong. It's eventually revealed that her consciousness was cytonically swapped with a Varvax ambassador who wanted to learn more about the technologically superior human weapons in order to wage war against the rest of the Varvax. Jason learns the peace of the rest of the universe comes by exiling or imprisoning dissident elements in their societies. This prompts Jason to instruct Lana, his support operative and wife, to publicize the development of FTL travel. And that's the Cytoverse! Jancy Patterson, who co-authored the novellas with Brandon, is working on a further series called Skyward Legacy, which at this point is at, bing, 68%. But those take place a few years after Defiant, which is coming out slash actually out right now! The release party for that coincides with Dragonsteel 2023, which if you are attending, you should come see me in the exhibitor hall, right here, booth 245, right down the aisle when you come in. I've got lots of cool stuff, much of which I have shipped out to my patrons, like Doug, Matt, Steve, Data Gremlin, Alec, Craig, and Scotty. You can join them and get cool swag! But more importantly, we've got a new Sanderson novel. Go read and find out! The end.